Good evening and welcome to Festival of the Arts Boca's Authors and Ideas series. We're great to have you with us. It looks a bit different this year as we're all sitting in our homes, but I think you'll agree that the speakers we're presenting this year are just as engaging and as relevant as always. Our programs are free, however, we certainly could use your financial support, and it's very easy to do that. You can go to our website, festivalboca.org forward slash donate and fill out the form there. Or if you prefer, you can text to give. Just send a text to 41444 and in the body of the text, write BOCA21. That's BOCA, all lowercase, 21. And on this International Women's Day, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a woman who we could not do without here at the festival, the chair of our Authors and Ideas series, Cynthia Brown. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to get started on the Authors and Ideas portion of the festival. And tonight, I'm doing something I absolutely love to do, which is to introduce somebody who needs no introduction. Today, we are honored to have retired four-star Admiral James Stavridis speak to us on global affairs and in the age of corona. This is a man who has literally worked all over the world to help keep us safe on the sea, on the ground, and in cybersecurity. Admiral Stavridis was the first naval officer to serve as commander of the U.S. Southern Command, the first naval officer of U.S. European Command, and the first naval officer to serve as NATO's Supreme Allied Commander Europe. That alone should be enough to tell you we are dealing with an unusual person. But when he retired, he became Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And now retired from that, he is the operating executive of the Carlisle Group and the chair of the Board of Counselors of the McCarty Group. In addition to all of that, Admiral Stravides is the author of several books, numerous articles and op-eds, and often appears on MSNBC as a security analyst. But today is an important day for him because tomorrow is the launch of his new book, 2034, and it's already a bestseller on Amazon. It's a novel and a geopolitical thriller, and maybe he'll tell us a little bit about that too. Admiral, it's your turn. Well, Cynthia, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be uh, back at Boca. And I'm going to start by um, talking a little bit about, as Cynthia said, geopolitics and leadership in the time of coronavirus. And we're going to do it with some images as we go along. Um, let's all recognize that 2020 has been an unusual year, shall we say. But there are really three big things that have happened. The first is coronavirus. Now you're looking at that image and you could think that was uh, Central Park, maybe one of those pop-up uh, hospitals. Actually, this photograph was taken 100 years ago at the height of Spanish influenza, which infected 40%, 40% of the world's population with a 20% mortality rate, much worse than what we're experiencing now. And I, I use an old photo here simply to make the point that we, the human race, had been through pandemics before. They occur about every hundred years or so. They might accelerate a bit in the future. The point is we will get through this one like we've gotten through previous ones, including this one from a hundred years ago. But of course, there's been a strong and concerning impact on the global economy. So that's kind of the second big event of 2020. And then thirdly, we've had an election and elections have consequences. They changed things. So new administration in Washington, a global economy that is of concern and an ongoing pandemic. Pretty big, big set of challenges. And right about now you ought to say, well, okay, Admiral, what do you think? What will be the geopolitical impact of this trio of challenges? And what kind of leadership should we expect from this new administration in Washington to deal with it? Well, let's start with geopolitics and the impact on the global scene. And I'm going to start with China. China will come out a winner. China will come out with, if you will, a bounce in their step. China will feel 
emboldened by what has occurred here simply because their economy has recovered with extreme rapidity, mainly because they have authoritarian tools to deal with the pandemic that are not, shall we say, widely available in most other parts of the world. China will therefore double down on this, their strategy. It's called One Belt, One Road, and it's clever. It is a geopolitical and geoeconomic strategy that seeks to take finished products manufactured in China and push them out along these two paths, one to the north over land, one to the south by the sea, and it will bring raw materials back into China. It is a mercantile strategy and it is well constructed. Coming out of COVID, they'll double down on this. They'll also use cyber very, very effectively. And they're already doing so. We're very focused in cyber on the Russian hack, the solar winds hack. China is equally adept in cyber. And they will also push hard on this, the South China Sea. This is a vast body of water. It is without question full of hydrocarbons, full of oil and gas. And China claims it as territorial waters. It's roughly the size of the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico combined. China claims it all the way out to that red dotted line. And by the way, 40% of the world's shipping runs through that South China Sea. Controlling that is part of their strategy. And to control it, they're building these artificial islands. What they look like when you start building them is upper right. It's sand that's dug up from the bottom of the ocean. And then when they're finished, they look like that one on the bottom. They have airstrips, missiles, radars, tanks, troops. They're all over the South China Sea. They've built nine of them inside that red circle and they will use them to great military effect if, God forbid, we end up in a conflict with China. In the Navy, we don't call these artificial islands. We call them unsinkable aircraft carriers because that's how China will use them. They are also moving closer and closer to Russia. And that ought to concern us. The two of them together form a very formidable package because Russia has immense reserves of natural resources, especially oil and gas, but also timber arable land, fresh water, gold, rare earths. Down at the bottom left, you see Chinese and Russian soldiers hugging each other. That's after the largest military exercises since the end of the Cold War. And bottom right, that's a Chinese destroyer and a Russian frigate operating together, not in the North Pacific, where you might expect it, but in the Baltic Sea, in the heart of Europe. China will continue to be a disruptor to the United States. We have a rich, unfortunate basket of conflicts with China. Upper left, cyber. Upper right, an expansive Chinese Navy. The Chinese Navy today has more warships than your Navy does. Bottom right, trade and tariff disagreements are well known to all. Bottom left, we talked about artificial islands in the center control of the electronic spectrum, controlling the 5G networks as they emerge. So big challenges ahead between the US and China. How will it come out? We don't know yet. It might come out reasonably well. Look closely at this picture. It is a Chinese warship pulling in for a goodwill port visit in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Look at the upper left, you see the American flag flying there on that Chinese warship. Look at the crowd, bottom right. They have both Chinese and American flags. Hopefully, we can find our way to more pictures like this, where we cooperate and get along with China. But upper right, as Cynthia alluded to, my new novel, which appears tomorrow on bookstands everywhere, if you will, is called 2034, a novel of the next world war. It is a cautionary tale about how devastating and terrible a war with China could be. We have to 
drive toward the better outcome here. And that will be a challenge going forward. So coming out of the pandemic, look for an assertive China. How about our allies, partners, and friends in Europe, the European Union? Well, they finally got through Brexit, thank God, after four and a half years. And now the United Kingdom is a separate entity. This will cause Europe to come together and cooperate better than they have throughout these four tumultuous years. And NATO will continue to be a, a strong part of this transatlantic bridge. Overall, I assess that the European Union will come out neutral to perhaps a somewhat better position now that Brexit is over. Well, what about the developing world? So that's India and Pakistan, Sub-Saharan Africa, and of course here in this hemisphere, Latin America and the Caribbean. This is about 3 billion people out of the 7 billion who live in the world. And there is good news and less good news. What we ought to be concerned about in the developing world is the lack of medical facilities, the uneven structures of governance. On the other hand, these are very youthful populations in all three places, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. They are also more open air places, fewer air conditioned spaces. People are more used to being outdoors in many parts of these areas. So as you balance all of that, I think the developing world will come out diminished, but not destroyed coming out of this pandemic. Russia will continue to simply be a spoiler in the international scene. And as I mentioned, they'll draw closer and closer to China because they have few other truly effective options. Well, how about the Middle East? I wish I had better news. The Middle East will continue to be extremely difficult going forward. Upper right, Iran will continue to be a disruptive force leading the Shia wing of Islam. Bottom left, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will rally the Sunni parts of the world of Islam. Israel, our closest friend and ally in the region, will be continually threatened by Iran. The good news here is building on the Trump administration's Abraham Accords, hopefully Saudi Arabia will join those and we'll see an alignment between Israel and the Sunni Arab states that will help us in our drive to contain Iran. And then we haven't heard much from North Korea lately. Unfortunately, I predict over the next month or two, we're going to see Kim Jong-un reemerge on the international stage, probably launching a long range ballistic missile. He will challenge the Biden administration in its early days. Well, that's a, a bit of a walk around the world. How about here in the United States? Well, we went through some terrible events about a month ago. And unfortunately, our nation continues to be in a state of gridlock. And whether you are a, a supporter of President Trump and a Republican or a supporter of President Biden and a Democrat, you ought to be thinking to yourself, how can we overcome this gridlock in our country? How can we take away this idea somehow that wearing a mask is a political statement because it's not? That adorable little girl on the bottom left is my four-year-old granddaughter wearing her Minnie Mouse mask. We need to get past this idea of politics, particularly in response to the pandemic. The Biden administration is gonna have its hands full, let's face it. Not only COVID, not only a difficult economy, but that polarization in the nation, all of those will be big challenges. And in addition to the geopolitics that I've mentioned, they will have to deal with cyber, ongoing cyber challenges in national security, upper right, that's the Chinese cyber security force, cyber criminal activity, that credit card in the middle, hackivism, upper left. All of these will challenge this administration as will climate. Climate is still going to 
come back onto the agenda in a way that it has not been for the last four years as the U.S. rejoins the Paris Climate Accords. So, boy, that's a, a pretty significant basket of challenges facing this new administration. And so let me kind of turn to some ideas of some of the tools that I think a Biden administration will use as they try and deal with the challenges that I've outlined here. Let me start by saying I know this team. I know them well. I worked with them when I was Supreme Allied Commander five years ago or so. All of them were in the jobs that they're now uh, part of. In other words, the vice president of those years is now the president. Tony Blinken, upper right, was the deputy secretary of state, now the secretary of state. Jake Sullivan was the deputy national security advisor, now the national security advisor. My contemporary and good friend, Lloyd Austin, is now the secretary of defense. At the time, he was in charge of U.S. Central Command. Bottom center, Avril Haines, was a deputy at the Central Intelligence Agency. She's now the director of Central, of Director of National Intelligence. Janet Yellen, of course, has moved from her previous position to now be the Secretary of the Treasury. So the point is, it's a team with deep experience. And they're also, and I can say this knowing them well, it's a collegial group. They get along. They're not trying to score points on each other. They're not trying to be the leading scorer on the team. They're going to work together, I think, quite effectively. So experienced, collegial, kind of a no drama sort of group. That's good, again, because they're going to have their hands full. In particular, here's some things that may surprise you. I think they're going to be a fairly innovative team. Uh, small things, if you will, post-it-like advances, big moonshots, they'll take a few. Uh, crazy ideas like putting airplanes on ships, photograph taken 100 years ago. Today, we couldn't imagine not having those aircraft carriers. Watch for this team to be innovative. They're obviously already reaping the benefits of innovation that's occurred as a result of our response to the pandemic. But there are other innovations coming, including in the world of military and security activity, unmanned vehicles, artificial intelligence, special forces, that's a Navy SEAL trident on the left. Space is exploding. We now have a space force, hypersonic cruise missiles. There'll be a lot of innovation in this space. Watch for the Pentagon to reshape its force because it has to, if it's gonna face China effectively. And additionally, this will be a team that will leverage the innovations we're all experiencing. At the top, telemedicine is gonna reshape how medical care is delivered. Uh, center right, what we're doing right now, teleeducation. Bottom left, work from home. Look, I don't think it's gonna be sweatpants and shorts forever. We are gonna get back in those offices. My own office at the Carlisle Group is moving toward reopening this summer. But there are going to be fundamental changes in business travel. How often we get on that jet, I think, will come down. So these changes will drive innovations in society. All of that, I think, will be effectively levered by this team. So innovation. Secondly, look for the Biden team to be quietly effective in communications. They're going to shift the mode from a, if you will, traditional use of the megaphone to thinking of communications more as a bridge, more as a back and a forth. Um, good communication is like a bridge. It has uh, messages that move across it uh, relentlessly, but capably. And look for this team to be pretty good in this space as well. Now you're looking at that and you're thinking, okay, he's a retired admiral. These, what are these, shipping lanes or maybe they're airline routes or fiber optic cables? No, this is Facebook. The world according to Facebook, the brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook users. The tell, if you're a poker player, is that China is dark in this graphic. The Biden team will use the social networks, I think quite effectively, to move their messages. So innovation, communication, and third and finally, this is a team that is all about collaboration, teamwork, working together. 
Um, and, you know, I thought a lot about what kind of picture to put here. And I thought about putting a, a bunch of guys in a, a rowing shell in a crew uh, team all rowing together. But if you think about it, collaboration in the real world isn't like that. Everybody isn't rowing exactly the same stroke. Collaboration's like this. It's a peloton. These young ladies are in a very messy formation. It speeds up, it slows down, people fall down. Sometimes they're collaborating, sometimes they're competing, drafting on each other. It's complicated. That's what real collaboration looks like. And here's the NATO world, which looks very formal, right? But I can assure you having led this alliance at the military level, that it's hard. During my day, 28 nations, today 30 nations, and each one can impose its own ideas and control on the alliance. So it's messy and complicated. And here's another example. It's the coalition against the Islamic State. There are 77 countries in this coalition today. It's hard to manage these coalitions. The Trump administration did a fairly good job with these coalitions, this coalition management, and really accelerated the fight against the Islamic State. Hopefully, the Biden administration will build on that and move forward as well. And lastly, on collaboration, a word about international organizations. They're across the top of that graphic. Look, these are old, old organizations. They were created around the time of those Chevys that are still driving around Havana Harbor those old Chevrolets, they were built in the 1950s. But here's the point, they're still on the road, they still work, they're still running. You know, maybe they need a new paint job, maybe they need new tires, maybe they need a new engine. But I think the Biden administration will reach out and try and use these imperfect, but still capable organizations. Look for that kind of collaboration as well. Well, all of this will rest, as hopefully is always the case for the United States, on a basis of values. And we should just pause and say, well, wait a minute, what are our values? They are, if you will, democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, treat others as you would be treated. They come to us from the ancient Greeks, upper left, from the East as well. They pass through the Enlightenment. That's the young Voltaire on the right through our founding fathers to many leaders in the West today. These values matter. We execute them imperfectly, including gender equality and racial equality. We strive to create a more perfect union. We fail, but we also continue because we know these are the right values. And I think they will underpin the nation's efforts going forward. Look, all of this is hard work. As you know, I'm Greek American, so I'm required to have a Greek myth in every presentation. Here it is, Sisyphus. The Biden administration will find, just like the Trump administration, that the boulder rolls back down and crushes you from time to time. The measure of any administration is not do they always get the boulder to the top of the mountain? It's how they do when that boulder starts rolling back toward the bottom. And finally, they've got to move. They got to move at speed because events are moving fast. And here I would present to you the fastest thing on earth, a cheetah. It can go from zero to 60 miles an hour in three seconds, three and a half seconds. And look at that cheetah, it's, it's designed for speed, right? Has a very narrow head that is shaped so it can cut through aerodynamically. It has strong front legs. It has big lungs to process all that oxygen. It has powerful back legs to spring and to drive forward. Whoops, wait a minute. Look at the tail of the cheetah. If you were creating something from either evolution or creation, take your pick, why would you give something you wanted to be the fastest thing on earth a big, huge tail? Look at that tail. It's like the size of the after part of the 
back legs? Why doesn't it have no tail, no drag, or just like a little bunny tail? Well, the answer is, and the engineers in the crowd will know this, that if a cheetah is gonna go that fast and accelerate that rapidly and then try and turn, it needs that tail to counterbalance because otherwise it would just go tumbling into the jungle undergrowth. The point here is that the administration has got to go as fast as it possibly can, but it's got to keep the system stable at the same time. That I think is the fundamental challenge for the Biden administration going forward. So with that, I will pause. I'll click over to these if you'd like to uh, join me in the social networks in case you can't get your question answered uh, during our Q&A period, which starts in about one minute. Please feel free to contact me on any of these circuits. I look forward to our continuing conversation this evening and to uh, answering a few questions and comments as we go along here. With that, I will turn it back over to uh, okay. Cynthia. Well, thank you very much. And for those of you who are watching and want to ask questions, you need to click on our on the website on the Facebook Live or the YouTube channel. And you can go it, it, use either one of those and enter comments and questions. And we'll try and get to as many as we can, because I know people have questions. Um, it, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, you presented a rather overwhelming <laughs> Everywhere you look, um, there are intractable, it's seemingly intractable issues. Um, let's take a, 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 a one little one, which isn't so little, um, Afghanistan. Sure. Uh, what, are you, what, what are you thinking about how we proceed in Afghanistan? Um, I think in Afghanistan, we've been at war for 20 years. Who would have imagined that? And here's the good news. I think we are in fact headed toward an end game. And we still have some choices to make here. We can either see this thing end the way Vietnam did with helicopters lifting off the roofs of the embassy and an internal collapse in the country. I think that's what happens if we lose our patience here at the very end of the story or I think we still have a very reasonable chance at bringing the parties together to negotiate a conclusion. Let me point something really important out here, Cynthia, which is that it's hard to feel as though there's been progress, but let's do a couple of numbers. When I commanded that mission, as, as most folks will know, it's a NATO mission. I commanded it from 2009 to 2013. I had 150,000 troops, Western troops working for me there, about 100,000 American, 50,000 allied. We're now down to 2,500 Americans. We have already essentially pulled out the entire force. What is holding Afghanistan together and pushing the Taliban back are the efforts of Afghans. We have trained them, we've equipped them, We've taught them how to fight in a counterinsurgency setting. We're, in football terms, we're on the five yard line here. And I think that if we are willing to continue to keep a very small number of troops there, two, 3,000, our allies are willing to stay with us. By the way, there are still about 8,000 allied troops, less than 3,000 Americans, 8,000 allied troops. Really, they're almost three times our size. We can be the stiffener in what the Afghans do. And just uh, yesterday, uh, Secretary of State Blinken sent a letter to the president of Afghanistan, basically saying, you, President Ghani, you've got to cooperate, come to the table, let's make a deal in Afghanistan. We're very close to doing that. We've got a terrific U.S. ambassador who's driving the effort, a man named Zal Khalizad, who was our ambassador to Afghanistan, also our ambassador to the United Nations, very, very capable Afghan-American who speaks Pashtun and Dari. If anyone can bring these parties together, I think he can do it. 
I think there's a two in three chance that we'll have a successful outcome there. One in three, could the wheels really come off? Could it fall apart entirely? Sure. But I'm cautiously optimistic about how this one turns out in Afghanistan. And it'll be the result of work done by the Bush administration, by the Obama administration, and by the Trump administration with the a Biden administration potentially being the one who can finally close the deal. Let's hope that's how it comes out. Um, we've got a question from Christina Wood in the audience, which is a, an interesting one. Uh, what, if anything, should we be doing to counter the Chinese in Africa, and for that matter, all over the world? Yeah, this is a great question. And by the way, China is moving uh, aggressively in Africa, in South Asia, and in Latin America and the Caribbean. Again, as I mentioned, about 3 billion people live in those geographies. Uh, China would very much like to make all three of them part of this one belt, one road strategy. They would like to flow raw materials into China, uh, manufacture uh, and export and exert political influence along the route. It's, as I said before, it's a clever strategy. It's called One Belt, One Road. Um, additionally, they're going to double down on control of the South China Sea, and they are going to continue to challenge us in cyber and come closer to Russia. So the big question, as, as the uh, listener asks, is what should we do about it? Well, I'll give you three big things we should do. Number one, we should construct a strategy. Remember in the Cold War, we had something called containment. I don't think that's the right strategy to use with China, but the idea of having a strategy, a holistic plan that brings together economics, diplomacy, politics, our military activity, our cultural influence, brings those together coherently in a plan would make a lot of sense. And I would start by putting Henry Kissinger, who's our greatest sinologist in charge of it, put the experts from all of those fields together and challenge them to show us the blueprint for dealing with China. Number two, we should confront where we must, confront where we must. We're gonna have to confront China on their claims of simply owning the entire South China Sea. That would be as preposterous as the United States claiming to own the entire Gulf of Mexico and all of the hydrocarbons and all of the islands in it. It just won't fly under international law. So we're gonna to have to confront where we must on China. And third, and finally, a fundamental part of our strategy should be to cooperate wherever we can. And I would argue two zones of cooperation that would make a lot of sense. One would be climate. Both nations have a vested interest in ensuring we improve global climate, reduce the effects of global warming. The second would be pandemic preparation. Because I assure you there's another pandemic coming, hopefully not for another 100 years. And hopefully we have learned an enormous amount, I believe we have in the last year about how to deal with pathogens. But another one is coming. And wouldn't it be a better world if the U.S. and China pooled their efforts together to deal with coming pandemics? There's simply two examples. I can think of many others. So number one, have a strategy. Number two, confront where we must. And number three, cooperate wherever we can. I think by doing those three things, we have our best chance at avoiding the scenario I lay out in my novel, 2034, a novel of the next world war. Believe me, we want to avoid that. And I think we can. I'm going to close on a personal note, if I can, Cynthia, which is that avoiding a war with China and having a strategy is deeply personal to me. And I'll tell you why. It's because my beautiful daughter, Greek-American Christina Stavridis, is married to Dr. Jimmy Wong, Chinese-American, first generation, mother from Hong Kong, father from Shanghai one of the millions of Asian Americans who live here and millions and millions of Chinese Americans. I have two little granddaughters who are both Chinese American. We got to get this one right. And so for me, it's very personal. And I tell you, 
any American ought to want a positive solution here. We need a strategy. We should confront where we must. We should cooperate wherever we can. Thank you. Um, that you, you almost segued very nicely into the next question, <laughs> which is from Harriet Nezar. She wants to know what motivated you to write fiction and one, and one set in the future. This is such a great question. You see the book over my uh, right shoulder here. Um, it, what motivated me was I could have written another nonfiction book. This is my 10th book. Uh, my books have sold well. I came and spoke to, to this festival, I believe, after one of my earlier books. But only by writing fiction can you imagine your way into the future. And if you think about some of the real security failures of the United States, they haven't been failures of intelligence. We've sort of known, we knew Japan was preparing some kind of attack, but we couldn't imagine they would close the switch at Pearl Harbor as violently and suddenly as they did. We kind of knew that there were terrorists out there. We never could have imagined that they would take airliners and bring down the World Trade Towers. We kind of knew a pandemic was coming, but we could never have imagined the lethality of this pathogen that has attacked us. In fiction, we can imagine. We can look into the future and create a cautionary tale. You know, people say to me, oh, Admiral, you've written a, a novel. It's a techno thriller. It really isn't. It's not about technology. It's, it's really about imagining a future that we want to avoid. So I found, Harriet, that fiction gave me the vehicle to imagine that future. And I'll close by mentioning a couple previous works of literature that kind of inspired me, and they were from the Cold War, was Dr. Strangelove by Stanley Kubrick. It was Failsafe. It was uh, The Third World War by Sir John Hackett. There's a, a rich literature of Cold War writing of novels and fiction that I think helped prevent us going into that war because we could imagine how terrible it would turn out to be. Think of Neville Shute's book, On the Beach. So that was in my mind as I wrote the book. Um, I don't think it's a techno thriller. I will say it's a page turner. I think it'll hit a wider audience. And I commend it to you and I hope you read it and I hope you join me in trying to figure out how we can avoid a war with China, not stumble into one. Um, we have a question from Art Liston who's concerned about disinformation on the right wing and the Russians um, and that it's uh, damaging our democracy and he wants to know how to counter that. I think I would couple that with my own question of how do you account for the rise of right wing all over the world? Yeah, let, let's uh, step back and recognize that authoritarian regimes have been the norm throughout all of human history until realistically speaking, a couple of hundred years ago in France during the enlightenment, this idea of what we think of today as mass democracy. You know, the Greeks had small city states that had some democratic traditions. Iceland had small population of democratic tradition, but really this idea of large scale mass democracy it's a new idea in the scale of human history. It's been around for 250 years. It's fragile, like many young things are. It faces the enormous weight of these authoritarian regimes, notably at this moment, Russia and China, who have always been, essentially throughout their entire recorded history, both of these civilization states have been authoritarian regimes. And this battle of newly emerged democracies in contrast to these authoritarian regimes, I think will be one of the light motifs of the 21st century. We don't know yet how it will come out. I'm gonna bet on democracy and I'll tell you why. Number one, if you really look at the, the trend lines of history, they kind of support the idea that we're moving toward 
more democracies. If you go back 100 years ago, Cynthia, there were only 10, maybe 15 democracies in the world. Today, depending on how you define the term, there are over 100 out of the 200 or so nations. So the trend lines are moving roughly in the right direction. Are there some that are sliding back? Sure. But more democracy, I think, will continue to move on the long trend line. Secondly, it's human nature. Um, you know, at the end of the day, people don't want to be told what to do. They want freedom, they want liberty. That's something different than democracy. Um, and in order to achieve liberty, you really have to have democracy, which is the engine that allows you to create liberty in your personal space. So I think human nature is kind of on that side. And thirdly, although it is certainly uh, often said these days that the emergence of the social networks and, and the question correctly alludes to this, how authoritarian regimes are undermining democratic regimes using the social networks, using misinformation, using disinformation. Well, that's been going on over the last 10 years, really because the ability to do that has only existed for about 10 years. The first iPhone came online in about, about 10 years ago. Twitter uh, came into being about 10 years ago. We're just now at the leading edge of these social networks, of these ideas of mass communication. And I think over time, the creativity, the energy on the side of the democracies will enable them to use these tools to undermine authoritarian regimes more than the other way around. It'll be a battle. There'll be an offense and a defense. I would say, however, I'm, again, like I am on Afghanistan, I guess, I'm cautiously optimistic, although we're gonna have some bumpy times ahead uh, to be sure. And it requires our vigilance, our engagement as the leading democracy in the world to encourage the others. Okay, thank you. Um, Andy Andrus would ask you to comment on ongoing events in Hong Kong and how in the broader region, in, and in the broader region, and how this will challenge the US and Europe. Yeah, it's a good question, Andy. Um, first of all, Hong Kong uh, is under extreme Chinese pressure. And it's in a weird place, as in, not physically, but as in it, it was given over as from its former status as a crown colony in 1997 with a long-term lease, um, if you will. China's violating the terms of that. But bottom line, I think it is unlikely that the United States or the West is going to be able to do anything to move Chinese behavior on Hong Kong. What I do think is important in the region is Taiwan. Taiwan is at a different scale. Uh, Taiwan is not an independent nation. They're, if you will, kind of affiliated with China, but they have made very clear to China that they uh, are not looking forward, shall we say, to joining fully with Chinese sovereignty. China's playing a long game here. And what will happen, Andy, is the way that China is cracking down on Hong Kong will have a significant knock-on effect on the appetite, shall we say, of the Taiwanese to join China. China said that Hong Kong would be the beneficiary of one nation, two systems. That certainly isn't what's occurring. And for the Taiwanese, led by a woman I admire greatly, Madame Tsai, I met with her uh, just before pandemic times in Taipei. Um, I don't think they are gonna go gently into that good night with China. So I think the United States should take a forward leaning posture, should work more closely with Taiwan, provide them more advanced capable technology and make clear to China that a red line for us is China's um, using military force to forcibly bring Taiwan into alignment with China. That's tricky. And that potentially is the flashpoint that I explore in 2034. And it's a real flashpoint. 
Now I'll conclude with your excellent addition to the question, how does this impact us in Europe? As the Europeans watch China put their thumb resolutely on the Hong Kongers and put more and more pressure on Taiwan, I think the Europeans will recognize the challenges of China, will be more willing to stand with us in opposition to this kind of bullying by China. That's, I think, a mistake China is making. It will cause US and Europe to come closer together. And that together, US, European Union, NATO, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, or other Asian allies, that is a pretty formidable force, back to a previous question, on the side of democracy. I'll conclude here, Andy, by saying a swing vote in all of this will be India. India is a democracy, a vibrant democracy. If India ends up in that position as this century unspools and aligns itself with the West, I think that will be a sufficient counterweight to China and Russia. And again, gives me cautious optimism about the possibilities of democracy in this century. Don't forget about India. India plays a very interesting role in the book, by the way. That's interesting. Um, I know that your time as uh, head of Southern Command gave you a lot of exposure to South America. And while it doesn't seem as critical as some of these other issues, what's your take on Venezuela? Um, it is a critical issue for starters because it's right here in our hemisphere. And we had to recognize um, the Americas are a very special place in the world from the northern tip of Alaska in Canada to Tierra del Fuego in the very south, Argentina and Chile. There's no war. There's no possibility of a war. No one is going to uh, start a war. All that is very, very unlikely. We haven't had a war in the Americas since the 19th century. That's pretty remarkable. Secondly, we share, very broadly speaking, almost all of these nations share very common roots, um, both indigenous and back to Europe. Um, and thirdly, we are so incredibly rich in natural resources throughout these Americas. Does that mean we don't have problems in the Americas? It does not. And our principal problem, I would say, is the one you allude to, Cynthia, which is Venezuela. And if you haven't really tuned in to what's going on in Venezuela, it's first and foremost a humanitarian disaster. There are close to 5 million Venezuelans on a pre-crisis population of around 30 million who have fled the country altogether. Um, internally, the economy is in shambles. Um, there are limited services, health services. It, it is a terrible situation. What the United States should do here is, well, let me begin by saying what we should not do. This is not a situation where we ought to send in the 82nd Airborne. And I commend the Trump administration for strategic patience in Venezuela. We ought to work with the Organization of American States. We ought to try and work collectively, not appear to be driving the situation. We ought to assuage the humanitarian challenges that are at play here. And frankly, as distasteful as it is, we had to conduct a negotiation with uh, Nicolas Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela. Um, Venezuela ought to work. It, it, it's an incredibly rich country in terms of natural resources, obviously, but through mismanagement, bad leadership, bad economic theory, it spiraled into a humanitarian disaster. The best thing we can do is to work collectively in the hemisphere get Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Canada to work with us. Uh, let's bring Maduro to a negotiation. We may not love the ultimate outcome, but it's better than the, the horrific situation that is occurring right now. So negotiate, um, recognize the challenge, and work with our partners, allies, and friends in the region. And that's the prescription for Venezuela. Um, have a couple more here uh, from Stephen Schneider. 
Space law was largely built in response to Westphalian geopolitics. Can we maintain peace as we move away from res communis? Um, this is a, a, a very good question. One I would have posed as Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and uh, my own PhD is in international law. Um, I, won't, um, I won't go down to the deep technicalities here, but in a nutshell, I think we can and we will, and really we must maintain this idea of freedom of space in the same sense that we think of freedom of the high seas or here on earth, perhaps the closest analog is Antarctica. Um, if we start trying to divide up space, um, it, it becomes untenable. I mean, how far does space extend perhaps to the mind of God? Um, I, I think that space will in fact continue to be the common heritage of mankind to take the line out of the treaty from the law of the sea. Now that doesn't mean we will not have zones of real competition and hopefully not, but perhaps zones of military conflict in space. Uh, this is why the Trump administration created a space force, which I agree with. It's not big, uh, maybe 15,000 people, but it makes sense given where we're pushing into space in the same way that it does to have a Navy, uh, even though we recognize freedom of the high seas. So I think we've got to rely, Stephen, on international law, as your question um, implies, and also on the common sense aspects of the nature of space. And frankly, I could extend your question, by the way, into cyberspace, where I think over time we're going to need um, treaty structures that reduce the tension, reduce the challenges. Again, I think that analogy of the law of the sea treaty is pretty apt here, both in space ultimately and in cyberspace. Stay tuned, this is a, this is a hot area in international law. It's one we talk about a lot at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Thanks for raising it. We've got one last question. And that is from Charles Astro. How is Afghanistan today different from Germany at the time of the Berlin airlift? It's a good question. Um, first of all, there's only one set of outside powers involved. If you think about the Berlin airlift, you had Russia on one side, an occupier, and on the other, the US, United Kingdom, and France. So you don't have that kind of tension in the country. I think that's advantage to Afghanistan. Um, secondly, while Germany was, much of it was largely destroyed, there was an underlying level of education there that really still does not exist in Afghanistan, advantage to Germany. And then thirdly, in Germany, there was no insurgency, there was no uh, German underground that was fighting the way the Taliban are fighting. So that makes the situation in Germany, while dire, um, quite difficult. Um, what we ought to think about, and I think your question is a good one, what is the level of effort we are willing to go to to preserve freedom and democracy in Afghanistan? Um, it doesn't even have to be at the level of the Berlin airlift. We can continue to uh, support the Afghan government and Afghan troops there, um, and they can carry the fight. Again, I think there's a two in three chance we can land it successfully, uh, which is probably higher odds than I would have given uh, during the time of the Berlin airlift that ultimately Germany would end up unified, whole, and free, which it has. Um, Cynthia, if I may, uh, you said that was the last question. I want to... One more if you have time. Um, actually, I have a closing statement I would like to make. So okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the time to do that. Okay. Um, because a lot of people ask me constantly about our domestic situation and about the, the, the constant conflict we have, it seems and feels inside the country. That picture I showed of those two antlers fighting with each other. And, and here I want to I wanna start by making a point about myself. I'm a registered independent. I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat. I've always been a registered independent. 
I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton, and I was offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. I think of that kind of as two bullets whizzing by my head. Uh, but my point is, I'm a centrist. And I'm going to tell you three things, three practical things we can think about as Americans to try and overcome this gridlock, none of which, by the way, are partisan in the least. One is we can celebrate the idea of service. And here I don't mean simply telling military people like me, thank you for your service. We really appreciate that. And I always thank people when they do that. But here's my point. There are so many ways to serve this country, our military, our police, our firefighters, our diplomats, our Peace Corps volunteers, CIA officers, teachers in Central Florida teaching a packed classroom under COVID conditions for $37,000 a year. You think they're serving the country? I do. How about our doctors, our nurses, our EMT on the front line of COVID? My point is, there are so many ways to serve the country. Wherever we see that as Americans, we should encourage it. We should thank those who are serving. We should make a point of that because I think service is nonpartisan. Service is bipartisan, if you will. That can help bring us together. Second is education, investing in education. And I'll start with something we've touched on tonight, which is these. That's my iPhone 12. You know, we hand these to children when they're somewhere between 10 and 11 years old. That's when we give that supercomputer to a child. We don't educate them. We don't tell them how to discern between what is real and what is garbage on the internet. We have work to do in education and not just on the internet, but in the broad spectrum of education. That is where we can best address the inequalities and the questions of social justice that plague us. So number two is education. And again, I would argue education is bipartisan. It's something we all recognize as parents and we need to afford our children. And third and finally, as voters, we should look for candidates who are willing to reach across the aisles, who are willing to work with the other side. We need that. And here I'm talking to you, whether you watch Fox and Friends every morning and listen to Sean Hannity at night, or you start with Morning Joe and you wrap up with Rachel Maddow, and Brian Williams on MSNBC. We need to find candidates who are willing to work with the other side. Policy disagreements are fine, but working with each other is really the value. And, you know, I spent five years as dean of the Fletcher School in the Massachusetts, the most liberal state in the country. But it has a Republican governor, Charlie Baker, Republican, because he reaches across the aisles. My congressman happened to be a Democrat, Seth Moulton, young guy veteran, constantly reaching across the aisle to his Republican colleagues. We need to find those kind of candidates. Um, I would argue those are three things we should think about. They're very practical things. And I encourage all of us to think about them as we try and work together as a nation. We've been here before. We've had major disagreements in this country in the late 60s, in the 19th century, certainly the Civil War. We've had insurrections and rebellions and riots. We will get through this, but the best way for us to get through it is to work together, try and find ways to do that, listen to the other side, empathize, all those things will help. With that, Cynthia, thank you for having me on. I hope I get to do this again sometime in beautiful South Florida. I was born in West Palm Beach. I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I love this state and I look forward to being with all of you at uh, Boca in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you. And this was a slight change up with uh, instead of you and Richard Haas and maybe we can do that <laughs> next year. So what a thank deal. You. <laughs> Thanks everybody. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.